Welcome everybody to your free GMAP prep hour. It is December 13th, 2022. My name is Reed Arnold. I will be your host through the wonderful world of the GMAT. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, to those of us joining uh, on YouTube, welcome. Happy to have you in the post, uh, post live session world. Uh, currently, full disclosure, the live group has not shown up yet. So I will be teaching you specifically uh, how to handle a specific kind of critical, re well, two specific kinds of critical reasoning questions, um, how to tie them to other critical reasoning questions. I'm speaking vaguely because I don't want to spoil too much. Um, but tonight's lesson is on critical reasoning. I guess if you're watching on YouTube, now that I say this, you've seen the, the title to the video. So there's no reason being coy. You know why you're here. Uh, today we're talking about weakening arguments, in particular two question types in critical reasoning that I actually think are basically weakeners in disguise. Okay, so I'll actually, since there is no live audience, I'm going to jump to the kind of hopes for this lesson tonight. Um, the goal here, the session goal, is one, to identify which of these, which question types in critical reasoning are actually weakeners in, disi in disguise, even though they don't express themselves as weakeners, right? The traditional weakened question you're used to seeing says, which of the following is true most weakens the argument. There are certain critical reasoning questions that don't ask that question, but I think are basically asking that question without expressly doing so. So we're gonna identify which two question types do that. Um, as part of that, we're gonna talk about weakening arguments broadly, what it means to weaken an argument on the GMAT, how do you weaken an argument on the GMAT? Uh, in my opinion, I think that's the single biggest skill in critical reasoning is being able to weaken an argument in the way that the GMAT rewards weakening arguments. It's one thing to do it in day-to-day -day life, in your you know, arguments with friends and uh, family, all that good stuff. But in the GMAT, there's a very particular way of arguing. <clears throat> and if you're good at weakening arguments on the GMAT terms, you will be better at critical reasoning broadly. I'm losing my voice all of a sudden. Excuse me, I'm going to drink some water. Okay, there we go. Um, and thirdly, more broadly, to uh, specify what it means to state the goal when you're working through the four steps of a critical reasoning argument. Um, there's a moment after you've deconstructed the argument and before you go to the answer choices where I advocate and many other teachers advocate stopping, pausing, and kind of specifying to yourself what you need to look for in an answer choice. And um, it's easy to be, lazy is a harsh word, but it's easy to be um, vague. And I think a little bit of specificity there is actually very, very helpful. So today there will be a good chance to practice stating the goal in the context of weakening today, but that skill can apply. I'm sorry, there's a siren now blaring right in the background. Um, we'll let it pass. Okay. Um, that skill of specifying what the goal of an answer choice should be is something you can use on many other critical reasoning question types. So to start, and again, this will be a little bit um, less of a surprise for you, but I want you to read through these three critical reasoning questions. There's no answer choices, obviously. I want you to read the three prompts. Now you're gonna find that they are very similar and that's intentional, obviously. Um, but there are some kind of subtle differences. And what I want you to do is to think about, think of them each on their own terms. Make sure you understand each on its own terms, both what is argued or what is written about and what the question then asks. And think about how these questions are both similar and different from one another. I'll, I'm gonna pause the, well, I'm, you can pause the video for five minutes or so. Um, but pause the video, read these arguments, and think about how what is asked, what are the similarities, and what are the differences in these arguments and the questions that they ask you to, to answer.
All right, so we have had uh, someone join the Prep Hour Live and in, in somewhere in this five minute gap, I think something went wrong with the display. So those of you who are watching on YouTube, if it, the screen went blank, I apologize. Um, again, rewind and pause and, and read these. Um, for the rest of the class, I'll do what I did here. I'll, I'll set the clock and actually, you know, you can just use the time that I said, or if you want to pause, you can take more time yourself. That's the beauty of YouTube. But uh, these three questions, obviously there's some similarities between them, right? We have a question about a shortage of billiard balls in Sweden based on a number of billiard tables sold in Sweden um, and some, you know, some other kind of information about the situation. They're very similar, but there are some subtle differences, right? Here when we're filling the blank, here we are weakening an argument. That's kind of a standard weekend prompt. Here we're trying to explain why no billiard ball shortage occurred. So here we're told that there was no shortage of billiard balls. So three similar but subtly different questions, though ultimately I'm going to point out that these are all actually, uh, when it comes to what we need to do in choosing an answer, completely identical. So what we're talking about today are fill in the blank and explain the discrepancy questions. And I'm going to argue that these are actually just weakening the argument questions in disguise. Uh, all of these questions, question types kind of circle around very similar reasoning skills and reasoning processes that uh, you get rewarded for on the GMAT. So just a reminder of kind of the four steps in a critical reasoning question. First, first thing you're gonna do is identify the question that you see, what kind of question is it? Now I'm gonna put a little caveat with that today because sometimes the prompt of the question might seem like it's not in this instance tonight, a weaken the argument question. Sometimes it actually looks like a strengthen the argument question. But when you actually get down to what the goal of your of the question is, you'll actually find it is a weaken the argument question. Okay. But you read the question first, then you deconstruct the argument, then pause and state the goal. Again, this is one of the major lessons of the night is is what to do with this step and how to use this step to be good and specific. And then we'll go to the answer choices and work from wrong to right. Okay, so let's talk about fill in the blank and explain the discrepancy questions. And I will explain why I think these are not substantially different from weaken the argument questions. Okay, so here is a portion of what's going to end up being a fill in the blank argument. Usually in fill in the blank arguments, the question is actually before the paragraph. It's going to ask you, you know, to logically complete the argument given. Sometimes it'll even say which of the following most supports the author's argument or something to that effect. These are the questions that at their first glance will look like strengtheners. It's going to look like you're going to strengthen someone's point of view. And to some degree, you are. You are plugging in a blank. You're putting information into a blank that is going to support someone's point of view. And so it's reasonable to call these strengtheners and many teachers or in test prep manuals and uh, videos, you'll see that a lot, that they, they call these strengtheners. And I totally understand that. I'm just gonna argue that the way you're gonna strengthen on these questions is actually to weaken someone else's argument. And so let's just use this, let's use this little portion as an example, right? The Arctic squid fish, and I've been lazy, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. We're gonna tell a story about the Arctic squid fish in this paragraph. We're gonna build some expectations. If we're really reading carefully, we might sense that this story about the Arctic squid fish is building some sort of expectation about something. We might not even know what the something is, but we can tell that it's leading somewhere. And then you're gonna see that word, however. And that's an important word to notice. That word, however, indicates a change. It indicates a shift. It indicates that, hey, well, actually, I'm going to ask you this. I want you to stop for 15, 20 seconds here, and I want you to think about what this, however, really indicates, and try to specify to yourself what's going to happen after this, however. It's going to be tough to be specific, obviously, but in a general sense, what's going to happen?
So this, however, indicates that whatever these expectations are, even if they're not really explicit yet, are not going to be met or the author disagrees with him. Something is, in the author's opinion or in this story, incorrect about those expectations. And here, you clearly don't know what they are because I've been so generic. But even sometimes in an argument, you won't know exactly what they are. But often, it will become specific. So let's fill in the blank now. Let's fill in what comes after that, however. And I want you to think about what comes, what uh, the information after the however tells you to think about in this problem here. Take 15, 20 seconds for that. Okay, so what comes after there, however, is information, or at least the author's opinion, that the squid fish will continue to expand its hunting territory. So says the author, because, and then it's our job to fill in the blank. So the reason many books and teachers will call these strength in the argument questions is because we are going to strengthen the argument that the squid fish will continue to expand its hunting territory. Right. We're giving a reason to think that the squid fish will continue to expand its hunting territory. But because of the way the GMAT works, because of the way GMAT critical reasoning is built, and because of the way this question and prompt are structured, um, in order to show why the squid fish will continue to expand its hunting territory, well, we already know that that's in conflict with whatever this very generic stuff is. Again, I've been super generic, so you don't really know what it says, but whatever comes in that first chunk, it turns out is leading to an expectation that actually the squid fish, and so this is a conclusion for someone, right? Uh, and you might want to call it a counter conclusion because it's not my author's conclusion, technically, it's someone else's conclusion, but someone thinks the squid fish will not continue to expand its hunting territory. And the reason some people think that apparently is all that blah, blah, yada, yada, telling the story. That whole first half of this argument is, even if it's not explicit yet, even if it's not clear, is going to build an expectation that, you know what, this squid fish is not going to continue expanding its hunting territory. And then we drop in that however, and the author says, actually, yes, it will. And we're gonna strengthen the author's point of view. But here's the thing, in terms of the GMAT, what does it mean to strengthen an argument? which is actually very, very precise. In, real, in the real world, there are many ways to strengthen an argument. In the GMAT, it's actually pretty straightforward. If I'm going to strengthen the argument that, for instance, um, it is raining, so the street is probably wet. Let's actually use a sidewalk just to be a little more realistic here. What we want to do on the GMAT to strengthen an argument is look at that gap. We want to look at the jump from the fact that it's raining to the belief that the sidewalk is probably wet. And say, you know, we want to look at what assumptions are being made. So one assumption in this argument is that the sidewalk is not covered. Okay, so what would it mean to strengthen an argument? We're going to strengthen this. To strengthen arguments almost always means strengthening the assumptions that an argument relies on. It doesn't mean strengthen the, the premise that it's raining. You kind of take the premises as fact. You don't want to make the premises better. Like it's raining really hard. 
You know, it's a thunderstorm. Eh, I, I don't care. It's raining. I get that it's raining. The question is, does that mean that the sidewalk is getting wet? We want to strengthen the assumptions that the argument requires. Well, if this is the structure, let me go back to the, if this is the counterpoint argument, my author's argument is really just that the squid fish will continue to expand hunting territory. But there's no premise. Usually to strengthen an argument, we look at the premise, conclusion, and the gap between. In a structure like this, there's no premise for the author's argument. So how do we strengthen it? Well, to strengthen it, we weaken the counter argument. We are going to weaken the argument that the squid fish will not continue to expand its hunting territory. Why does someone think it will? Because of all those premises that are unstated. And so what we really want to look for, and this is kind of one of the key ideas to tonight, tonight um, is this key question, which is actually, in my opinion, one of the most important questions in critical reasoning. Why is something not necessarily the case, even though something is the case, right? So here it's why might the squid fish expand hunting territory? Even though blah, blah, yada, yada. And those reasons that someone else thought they wouldn't, the squid fish wouldn't expand its hunting territory. And this is so vague, I don't have any ways to answer that question, but that's going to be the goal. That's what we are trying to do with the right answer choice. And that's really the goal in every weekend argument. Why might the conclusion, some conclusion, be wrong? In this case, why might this conclusion be wrong, even though these premises are true? And so these fill in the blank that at first feel like, yeah, I'm strengthening the author's point of view. You're going to do that by weakening someone else's point of view. Okay. And so that's why fill in the blanks are, in my opinion, weakeners in disguise. Now, explain the discrepancies a little bit different, but also not. Okay. The squid fish, blah, 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 same thing, right? I'm, I'm being intentionally vague. Then we have this word surprisingly. And it might... It might be surprisingly, it might be another however, it might be a nevertheless, it might say despite this. But again, what's going to come after that surprisingly? Something that contradicts the expectations. Whatever these expectations are, surprisingly, however, nevertheless, despite all these facts, then we're going to get this information here. The squid fish continue to expand its hunting territory. Now notice this is a little bit different. Because here, the author is not making an argument. No one's making an argument. That's, in fact, why a lot of times people talk about explaining the discrepancy as if it's outside of the argument world in critical reasoning. But I actually think it really fits right into the world of arguments in critical reasoning because there once was an argument. There's not an argument anymore because we know what happened in an explain the discrepancy question. They tell us the story of what happened, but what you want to find is the surprise the thing that was not expected because whatever was not expected is the opposite of what was once the conclusion so my author at one point concluded that the squid fish will not continue to expand its hunting territory same idea as before the reason i know my author thought that is because my author was surprised that that didn't happen. And that's what explaining the discrepancy questions are going to involve, something someone didn't expect. Why did the author expect that? Again, blah, blah, yada, yada. All that information that I left out because I was lazy. Not really, because these are just examples. The only difference between an explain the discrepancy argument and a weaken the argument, weaken the argument question, if this was an argument on a weaken the argument question, my job is to look at this and say, maybe this is what, maybe that's not true. And I would ask that question, right? Why, 
uh, did these, why might the squid fish continue to expand its hunting territory? Even though blah, blah, yada, yada. And so even though this is a different kind of question, even though there's not really an argument here in the question as written, at heart, the thing we need the answer choice to do is identical. To explain why the squid fish would continue hunting its, uh, continue expanding its hunting, why the squid fish would continue expanding its hunting territory, even though whatever story we tell about the squid fish is also true. So it's the exact same goal for the answer choice, even though the setup is different, even though it's not explicitly asking us to weaken an argument, we can see that there is an argument that we would want to weaken, even if, as is the case here, it's an argument that we already know is wrong. That is the difference. We know now that that conclusion isn't true. Actually, the squid fish did continue to expand its hunting territory. I know you used to think it wouldn't, but it did. You just don't know why. Well, the reasons why are the same reasons we could think of to weaken the argument back when it was an argument. That made sense, rewind and rewatch. So it was a little quick, okay? My point is that the, the things that would weaken this argument before we knew that conclusion was false, right? Why might this conclusion be false? Even when we don't know it's false, those same things are the reasons why it ends up being false if it ends up being false. So it's really just weakening an argument we already know is false. So let's tie this all together now and look back at that first question. By the way, I made this question up. I, I think it's you know close enough to realistic for a free GMAT prep hour, even though it might be a little bit um, silly. But look at these three prompts and go through the kind of these first steps. Identify how these questions are different technically deconstruct the argument or in one of the cases, because there's not actually an argument right here, there's not actually an argument. So deconstruct just the story, but pause and state the goal. And the thing is, is that all of these goals, the answer choice for these questions needs to be the same. And it's something in the structure of why is something not true, even though something else is true. So revisit these, I'm gonna give you here three minutes to reread and try to specify what, and again, be specific here, because again, what I want to move past today is to read a question like this, which of the following most weakens the argument. And then you go to pause and state the goal and you say, oh, I wanna weaken the argument. Well, yeah, I know you wanna weaken the argument. What does that mean in this context? Same thing on a short, it's like, I wanna fill in the blank. I wanna strengthen the author's point of view that the analyst prediction are overblown. Well, yeah, I know that's the goal. What does that mean in this context? I want to explain why there's no billiard ball shortage. I know. What does that mean in this context, right? To be a little bit more thoughtful and specific on what you need the answer to do in these questions. So take here three, four minutes. All of them have the same goal. Specify what that is in this kind of terminology.
All right, gang, that's four minutes. If you're on YouTube and you want more time, pause and keep working, that's fine. But let's think about this. Ultimately, these three different questions, at least on their face, have the same goal for their answer choice. We want to know why there isn't or wasn't, tense doesn't really matter in critical reasoning, why there isn't or wasn't a shortage of billiard balls, even though um, there's doubling of billiard table sales and Sweden does not import uh, billiard balls is kind of a silly argument, I admit, but so Sweden does not in, import billiard balls. I'm sorry, does not uh, make billiard balls. And imports have not risen. Okay. And if you want, you can include this last bit that there's, you know, about equal or not more uh, sets of billiard balls than billiard tables. That last bit's a little, I mean, it is a premise, but I think the first bit is the big one here. We want to specify why we didn't see a shortage of billiard balls, even though there was a doubling of billiard ball, of billiard tables in Sweden in the last few months. Ultimately, that's the kind of premise conclusion that's been set up. Premise conclusion, someone expected in each of these situations, someone expected um, an increase or a shortage of billiard balls. Again, this is kind of silly. Why? Because there's been a doubling in sales of billiard tables. And that alone might not be enough. It's also that we no, no increase in imports of billiard balls. We don't make billiard balls. So it's like, we have to import them. That's the GMAT saying, you have to import these. And we don't have a surplus, basically, right? There are not substantially more sets of billiard balls than there are billiard tables in the country. So we don't have a big surplus of billiard balls. It's basically one set of balls for a table, it seems. Maybe a little bit more, but not substantially more. And we doubled sales of billiard tables. Okay, and we have an increased imports. So if we're selling all these billiard tables, we're probably gonna have a shortage of billiard balls for those tables for all these reasons. That's what someone expects in each of these paragraphs for all their differences, that's the goal, or that's the, that's the thought that someone had. And it's our job to say, maybe not, or in this case, they tell us, right? Here they tell us there no such shortage occurs, occurred. It's our job to explain why there wasn't a shortage or why there might not be a shortage, even though these premises are true. We are weakening this argument in each of these. That's it. Okay. And so again, you wanna be more specific about what your goal of the answer is. It's not just to weaken the argument. It's not just to explain the discrepancy. It's not just to, in this case, in the fill in the blank case, strengthen an argument. What are we trying to do? We're trying to explain why there wasn't a shortage of billiard balls, even though there's a big increase in sales of tables and all these other things, we don't make billiard balls and we don't have a surplus at the moment. So you would think, right? Oh man, people are gonna need to buy billiard balls for their tables, but we don't have enough. So we're gonna run out. Turns out maybe not. And in the third sentence, so third example, definitely not. And it's our job to explain how that could happen you can now be even more specific because now you can now that you've pinpointed what the real question is you can generate situations on your own right why would we not sell more billiard balls when we need them for these tables and you can just think of a few generic examples well maybe people are buying billiard tables without billiard they don't really want the billiard balls i don't know why decoration or something i don't know but if they're just buying the tables to buy the tables they don't need billiard balls that would explain what's going on here. Um, or maybe uh, they are buying the tables. Well, I don't want to spoil things. Actually, I'm going to hold that one to my chest a little bit. Since this is just a recording, I'm going to pull up the answer choices since we know what the goal of the right answer is. Okay. So pull up the answers here. And remember, for all of these, what we need. 
okay, is why no increase in, or why no shortage of billiard balls, even though we've doubled sales of billiard tables, don't have a billiard ball surplus, and no increase in imports, and we don't make them. So look at the answer choices and see which one you think accomplishes that goal. I'll give you about a minute and a half, two minutes for that. All right, so the answer that I had, and again, I made this one up, but I, I had answer choice D in mind. And I think this is mostly a fair question. Again, it's kind of silly and it's not official, but I think D is mostly fair. See if you can, if, if you didn't choose D especially, see if you can take a minute or two to reflect on why D does achieve the goal we want and why whatever answer you chose doesn't. So let's go back to that moment where we paused and stated the goal. We were thinking about ways, reasons why there wouldn't be a billiard ball shortage, even though these things were true. And the thing I mentioned was that maybe there is, uh, maybe people are buying billiard tables for decoration and they don't actually need billiard balls to play with. It's a little silly, but maybe that's the case. The other thing you might think of that I didn't want to give away just for the sake of fun on the answer choices, but you know, you might have reckon you might recognize like maybe people are buying billiard tables to replace old billiard tables. And you can use the same balls. You don't need to replace the balls. If you if you replace the tables, you don't need new balls. So you can increase sales of tables without needing to buy billiard balls. And so if you look at answer choice D, that's what that is meant to kind of hint at. If there's been a lot of humidity and it's caused wood to bend and warp. 
well, this is a little sneaky thing here in the intro. We're told that this game is played on a flat wooden table. Okay, so the fact that this is played on a flat wooden table, but humidity has caused the wood of furniture to bend and warp, that flat wooden table might not be flat anymore. There might have been a big, you know, a lot of pool tables that have bent and warped and are no longer flat and therefore the game is not playing on the surface it's supposed to be played on and so people are replacing their bent and warped pool tables billiard tables with new ones again this is a silly example so if you didn't miss this it's not the most realistic question i suspect it's a little bit niche and but i i, I do think it gets it, it's a it's just it gets the game across even if it's not particularly realistic okay um, if the price of billiard tables dropped substantially in the last few months, that's a tempting, in my opinion, that's a pretty tempting answer. But think about what that does. That explains why there was an increase in sales of billiard tables. But it doesn't explain why there wasn't an increase in the sales of billiard balls. And that's the key thing we're trying to explain or um, argue might not happen, an increase in sale of billiard balls. I'm sorry, a shortage of um, billiard balls. So this could explain why there was an increase in the sales of tables, but doesn't it explain why there isn't or wasn't or wouldn't necessarily be a shortage of billiard balls. This is an example of prodding the premise, okay? We already know that the sales of tables doubled. I don't really care why. What I wanna know is why the doubling of tables didn't lead to or might not lead to an increase in the sale of sets of billiard balls, okay? So that's a tempting wrong answer that prods a premise, deals with something we already know is true, but doesn't actually achieve the goal we need the right answer to achieve. Okay, many different games can be played with the same set of billiard balls. That might be true, but okay, why did we see this increase in table sold and not a corresponding desire for billiard balls, right? Why did we not end up with a shortage of billiard balls? That does not explain that. Okay. Um, most of the tables purchased were purchased by people who did not already own a set of billiard balls. If anything, this makes me think the opposite. This, this is almost the opposite of what we need the answer to do, which is a common game in critical reasoning to strengthen instead of weaken or weaken instead of strengthen, right? If these tables were bought by people who don't have a set of billiard balls, why did they not need billiard balls, right? Wouldn't they need billiard balls? Wouldn't that lead to a shortage? If anything, C does the opposite of what we need the answer to do. Same thing with E. Almost no one would choose to have a billiard table without a set of billiard balls. Well, okay, then these people who are buying all these tables, don't they need balls with them? Why would this not lead to a shortage, right? E does the opposite of what we need the answer to do. So D gives us reason to think that maybe these tables are being replaced. So these, these tables are replacing old tables and the same balls can be used on. This is all, by the way, again, this is, this is weakening arguments one-on-one, -on -one, right? We're in the world of weakeners. Um, we have done several free prep hours on the subject, but two ones top of mind that I think are helpful are this one from my colleague, Whitney Garner. She does a great, great lesson on uh, the assumption family in general, including weakening arguments. But it's just a great high level must watch for, for people who want to get better at critical reasoning on the test. I did uh, a lesson on what I called the three key questions on critical reasoning. And the main question that I introduce in that lesson is this, why blank, even though blank, right? Why is something maybe not true even though this other stuff is true. That's kind of what I consider the heart of critical reasoning. There's also a lesson I made called the value of pre-thinking, which admittedly is almost all data sufficiency, but the last question is a, crit a critical reasoning question and shows how stopping at that moment before going to the answer choices and specifying, like kind of untangling and specifying what you need the answers to do can be helpful. So uh, let's just do, we have about 10 minutes left. Let's just do two more examples um, and uh, call it a night here, but I, I'm gonna pull up a question. I want you to answer the question, but I also want you to think about what we're kind of talking about. What is the why blank even though blank? 
that's buried in this question? How can you know to look for that in this kind of question? Um, what argument are you ultimately weakening to answer this question? What specifically do you need the answer to do? So take here three minutes to deal with that on this particular problem. Okay, so let's kind of talk about this argument here. Step one, identify the question. Question asks, which of the following if true helps to account for the drop in reclamation costs described? Okay, helps to account for is explaining something. You're explaining a discrepancy. That means that someone used to expect something that didn't end up to be the case. Identifying what that is specifying why they thought that is, is going to be the key to answering a question like this. So we kind of read this story. We have this country that put regulations so that um, operators had to reclaim their mines. I don't know exactly what that means, but I, I get that it's some, you know, undo the mess they've made, making the mine. Okay, since then, reclamation technology has not improved. So whatever you need to do to reclaim a mine, basically the same it's ever been. I just know, okay, so remember you're building an expectation. There's a sense that um, you're, you know, you're headed towards something. And so if reclamation technology has not improved, I'm kind of wondering like, well, it's probably as hard to reclaim a mine as it's ever been. Maybe, and this is what ends up being the case, maybe it's as expensive Right? It, it should cost the same to reclaim a mine since the technology is not better. Okay, Unless maybe wages have dropped substantially or something like that. But that's kind of where I'm leaning right now. It's like, okay, well, if, they're if the technology is not improved, other things have not improved. That's kind of where it's leading. Yet, 
says the author. The cost of a mine being reclaimed is yada, 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 less than half what it cost to reclaim mines after this law was passed. And so I kind of, okay, now I get it, right? Conclusion, probably something like the cost of reclaiming is about the same as it ever was. Why? Because technology hasn't improved for reclaiming. That's the premise. That's, this is the argument that used to be, right? This is the expectation. Turns out, so says the author, this is wrong. Actually, it's half as much. So what do I need to explain? Hold up. How can the costs of reclaiming be half as much, even though the technology for reclaiming has not improved. And again, you can brainstorm some thoughts there. You can think like, well, maybe, again, maybe wages or maybe just you don't pay people as much to do it, I guess. Or maybe you're selecting mines that are cheaper to reclaim. Maybe people got tired of spending a lot of money reclaiming the mines. And so they started to choose mines that are cheaper. And that's gonna end up being kind of the key answer choice here. If we go back to the answers. Take a look at which of these, take a minute and reread the answer choices and see if, if your answer choice really shows like, oh, either you know we've cut the cost elsewhere for reclaiming mines, or we're choosing cheaper mines that cost less to reclaim. Take a minute to find that answer amongst these. I feel like I can play the Jeopardy music here. So the answer that achieves this goal is C. They've stopped mining in the mountainous areas where it's high to reclaim the mines. So they've cut out the expensive mines, leaving the cheaper ones to reclaim. That's why the price is half as much, even though technology hasn't improved. I don't really care about Balzania's surface mines to other country surface mines. I want to know why in Balzania the cost of reclaiming has cut in half. Um, I don't care why the use of coal has declined. Okay, why is it cheaper to reclaim mines than it used to, than it used to be? In order to justify B, you'd probably have to make a leap to get to A. When don't make the leap, just choose. I'm sorry, to get to C. Don't make the leap to get to C. Just choose C. Um, Surface mines continue to produce coal at a lower cost than underground mines. That's great, but I want to know why today's surface mines, the reclaiming costs are less than they used to be on average. Um, and E says that more, a greater percentage of the coal comes from surface mines. Okay, but again, why is the reclamation cost half as much, even though technology is what it's always been? That C is the answer that achieves that goal. So this is an explain the discrepancy, but again, it's weakening an argument in disguise. Someone thought the technology not changing would result in reclamation costs not changing. Turns out that didn't happen. So we're weakening that expectation that it would have. Um, let's do one last question. This one will be a fill in the blank. I really like this question also, the one I'm about to do. I think it's neat. Yeah, so take, uh, Again, take three minutes, not just to do this question, but to tie it to what we've talked about today. Identify what you need the answer to do, what argument you're weakening, 
and you know what that goal is why something isn't the case even though something is take three minutes here All right, so let's talk about again these, these first three steps. Identify the question, we are filling in the blank. We're logically completing an argument. And again, that at first feels like a strengthener, but most of these questions, there are some exceptions. And again, this is why pause and state the goal is important. You can actually reason through what you need the answer to do. But many of these fill in the blank questions that feel like you're strengthening an argument are actually weakening someone else's argument. Okay, so it's fill in the blank. We're going to deconstruct the argument. So there's this new machine that lets us harvest corn 15 inches apart instead of 30 inches apart. So they used to have to be 30 inches between now they can actually be 15. Okay. Corn planters, uh, corn planted this closely will produce lower yields per plant. So I'm planting them closer together, which would mean that there'd be more plants of corn in a field, right? It's kind of using just three here. It's not that much, but if I go, you know, if I do, here's the, if each of these is 30 apart, and then it's like, oh, but I can also put some in between, right? So I've gone from one, two, three, four, five to six, seven, eight, nine. So I can grow more, there's more corn plants. But there will be lower yields per plant. So each plant makes less corn. 
Okay. So this is actually an instance where I'm kind of building expectations in two ways, and it's not maybe clear. I guess the fact that this comes second gives me a sense of what the expectation is, right? So it's like we can grow more, but each corn plant doesn't grow as much corn. And the fact that that comes second kind of makes me think like, oh, so maybe this wasn't so good for the corn planters. Maybe it didn't really help their revenue or profit that much. Then comes the nevertheless. And then I get the specificity of what it says. Actually, they will double their profits. So there's the specificity. What did someone expect? Someone used to expect corn planters won't double profits. Because even when we are planting 15 inches instead of 30 inches, so it's, you know, you can almost double, right? I went from five to nine here. I could go from 20 to 39, 40 to 79. I can basically double my number of plants, but um, each corn plant produces less corn. But there's approximately two times as many plants, a little bit less. Even more reason to think we won't double our profits. So we're having a little bit less than two times as many plants, and the plants don't make as much corn. So we're not going to double profits, probably. That's what someone thinks. What's our goal? To say, actually, there's a reason why we might double profits. How do we do that? Well, we sell the corn for more. I don't know why that would be the case, but if corn grown closer tastes better, or you, I don't know. I don't quite get that, but I guess that's a possibility. Or what's the other way to raise profits? Cut costs. If somehow the situation results in a way of cutting costs, then I can double my profits perhaps. Even though I don't make twice as much corn, if I cut my costs enough, I can make twice as much profit. And so that's what I'm looking for in the answer choices. That is the goal. Okay, so go back through your answers here. Take a minute. See which one achieves one of those goals. Okay, so which answer choice achieves this goal? Answer A. With the lead, with the thing closer together, there's a dense canopy. Okay, why does that matter? You minimize the need for costly weed control and irrigation. So you can cut costs. So this is how you can increase profits, even though you don't, you can double profits, even though you don't double yield, because doing this allows you to cut costs. The fact that they need to grow taller Okay, how does that mean doubling profits? I already know they don't grow as much corn each plant. I don't, that doesn't help me. Um, more fertilizer required. That does the opposite of what we need. <laughs> if you need more fertilizer, that increases costs. So that does the opposite of what we need the answer to do. This makes me really think we won't double profits. Um, number of plants per acre will almost double. Again, I kind of already know that. That's kind of already baked in <laughs> to the situation. I already know we're almost going to double the number of plants but each plant makes less 
And again, that makes me think probably won't double profits. Um, requiring more frequent fallow years in which cornfields are left unplanted, that seems bad. That seems to decrease profits. That's gonna do the opposite of what we need the answer to do. So A is the one that shows, hey, we might cut costs. So take these arguments, these, these fill in the blank and discrepancy arguments. Again, these are weakeners in disguise. And think about what it means to weaken an argument. And here's the real thing I hope you do is really practice being specific about that. Don't just say, oh, I wanna weaken this argument. How? Why does someone think that argument holds? Because you got to weaken that reason. Be specific about what you need that answer to do. The more specific you are, the faster right answers can jump out at you. Um, if you're looking for other uh, free prep options, okay, you can check out our upcoming courses. The first class is always free. We'd love to have you. Um, we have other free foundations of math courses coming up. Also, we have um, free, I'm sorry, we have a free free math. <laughs> We have free courses, first, co first class of courses coming up. We have um, free prep hours like these once or twice a month. And we also have our free foundations of math classes happening twice a month. Um, those are really wonderful classes. I'm actually teaching one this Saturday. So those of you that are in the room, and there's not many of you, but those of you are, I'd love to see you there. Okay. Um, we talk about the foundations of GMAT math in a very GMAT way. I, I kind of love these classes. They're kind of my favorite to teach. Uh, check out our courses. Try them out. We talk about big stuff. Take it for free. No reason not to. Um, otherwise, best of luck in your studies, and I will see you at the next one of these.